Uh, okay, hi everybody, welcome back. Uh, we've got part two to the webinar. Um, we really wanted to make sure that we added this section on because we had um, so many questions uh, coming through towards the end of the original webinar, we ran out of time. Um, so yeah, we've pulled together uh, the most popular questions, um, certainly some common themes here, uh, and we're gonna make sure that we, um, we spend this next 30, 40 minutes going through and uh, answering your questions. So. Um, Let's get started. Uh, Ryan, over to you first of all. Um, Gabrielle asked, um, how can we train and empower our managers to manage their teams remotely? Um, we, use a, uh, we use a combination of training that we got um, partially from entrepreneurial operating system and partially from some consultants that we've used over the years. Um, it's effectively called a work system. And um, the key piece of that is this one page document that talks about your core area of responsibilities, the KPIs you're responsible for, um, the categories of your work. And then the most important thing at the bottom is what we call a decision matrix. And it basically says in your role, what you're, what you're allowed to decide and not decide on, either full authority, authority with input, authority with approval, or no authority. And those things, uh, that's really empowering to folks. The second thing is that we use a tool called a weekly update, which is a little one page thing that talks about for us, there's four areas of work. There's people, uh, basically how people interact with each other, preparation of the work, the production of the work and the processes you follow. And so we ask people to talk about three things that work and three things that are not working each week and then set up what their next week's objectives are. And then, and then any hurdles that you as the manager need to resolve like blocking items that you need to resolve and that way if we need to talk it's very clear what to focus on if we don't need to talk it's easy to get a quick snapshot and so those two things i think work really well in remote when um you either have to kind of schedule time or you don't have enough time to spend with each other in some cases interesting anything um hope melissa you want to add to uh, empowering managers to manage their teams remotely Oh, Melissa, you're on mute. Yeah, Melissa, I think you're on mute there. Oh, thank you. So I was just saying that I noticed that the screen says Avery, just for everyone um, listening out there. It, my name is Melissa. It's my son's uh, Zoom account, so I just want to put that out there. Another thing from working from home, make sure that um, <laughs> the account has your name on it and not your... <laughs> Uh, family's name on it. But to add to what Ryan said, for us at Stack Overflow, what we do is we have a system called Managing at Stack. It is very um, focused on first core values. Um, we, we're very, very focused on values first in terms of uh, ensuring that everyone, A, understands our values and B, actually lives our values. So we have a course by which we put every um, manager through and we empower them to manage their things through their teams through values. That's one piece. The second piece is managing for performance and coaching for performance. So we use a coaching for performance uh, methodology. I don't know if folks are familiar with it, but it's called the GROW method. Um, it's basically goals, reality, your options, and then what you're willing to do. And that's how we manage through performance, um, if there are any performance issues in the organization. So those are the two real big things that we do to empower our managers. Um, and one-on-ones is extremely important for us. We really, A, promote one-on-ones, and we enable managers and give them structure on how to have effective one-on-ones. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I assume doing that in person and doing that remote is, is really no different. Correct. We do every, all of our sessions are remote, quite frankly. We go through Zoom sessions um, and then we break people out into teams when we have larger manager training sessions where people, managers can collaborate with each other. That's great. That's great. Um, Hope, I'm going to come to you with a slightly different question. Uh, this came from uh, Penny Howie. Uh, she said, um, in the webinar, you talked about the role uh, of a bar raiser. Uh, in the final round of the interview process. Can you elaborate on the role of this person uh, and how you train them? Absolutely. Um, thanks for the question. I, um, so a bar raiser for us is somebody who is at that senior level leadership. 
um, and they typically may or may not be in the same organization in which you would make that hire. Um, we have these people trained on our, um, on our priorities. They have an understanding of how the role would partner cross-functionally across the board um you know with with the different groups that they potentially would be working with and they also um have access to the feedback from other interviewers before they go into the interview so they can dig deeper in places where there may have been you know a question mark or um or anywhere where they needed some additional clarification um we also ensure that these people are um have gone through just a standard um, interview process um, and training as well, which we do that all um, in small snippets that are um, easily digestible. All interviewers go through those. Um, there's about eight modules that are about eight to 12 minutes each, just depending. At the end of the at the end of the interview, once the um, once everybody's kind of gone through what we call their interview loop, we have all of the team, the interview team come back together and we run a debrief the same way that you typically would if you're gonna go grab somebody in a conference room and talk about the candidate that you met, you know, what you typically would do at the end of the day. Um, we'll walk through, the recruiter um, hosts that and the bar raiser um, typically will be the person who will dig deep into feedback from any of the any of the interviewers, um, ask those hard questions if those need to be asked, and then ultimately work with the hiring manager because that hiring manager and bar raiser typically are not the same person. And um, we'll come back and help determine, you know, if this person should be a fit or not. There are some organizations out there where a bar raiser would um, be the ultimate decision maker and the hiring manager doesn't have a, um, you know, doesn't really get a final say so, but that's not how we utilize bar raisers here. That's great. Um, and out of curiosity, how do you position that to the person who's been interviewed? And what's that stage of the interview process called externally? Yeah, yeah. so we, uh, <laughs> we call it our, um, our final interview and we okay. always prepare for everybody um, while we're walking through that. We say, this is our final interview and you know be prepared to talk through any of the things that you may have um you know that you may have been uh talked you know that you may have discussed while you were meeting with others and we set the stage to be very clear like you mm -hmm. typically won't have another conversation um from here unless the hiring manager wants to just have any last questions that come out from the debrief but um they walking into it they very much understand it's the final interview yeah, I love that. And we hear that from candidates all the time, that final stage essentially is an opportunity for you to demonstrate anything that you weren't able to demonstrate in your prior round. So we hear from candidates all the time that, you know, final stage is, uh, is, um, is always well received candidates by because that their final attempt to kind of demonstrate any gaps that they've had as well. So um, some, some great cohesion there. Um, okay, Melissa, coming to you for this question. Uh, this question was actually asked uh, 10 times uh during our webinar the other day um and it was what are some of the creative ways uh, that you can maintain team morale uh, and drive relationships and cohesion um in-person companies are able to have social events and happy hours um so how do you uh, replace this digitally so a couple of things um i would say you don't always replace it digitally you try your best to always enable more connections through different um channels right so one of the things that we do um, and we encourage all managers to do this is right now in covid it's a little tricky and we can't do this right but i will say what we what we normally do we always give budgets for meetups for remote teams so teams will get an opportunity to work um, and by region, so let's say, for instance, we'll have a Northeast, we'll have a Southwest, we'll have um, a uh, Midwest regions that get together and they just have a meetup, a small meetup for themselves. They have an agenda, they have a budget. Um, we help them get um, their meetup together in terms of what, what's the overall objective. Do you want to learn a specific piece in terms of what our next feature is going to be like? What is it? What's down in the product roadmap? So those are the types of things we do um, in person. COVID makes that a little bit tricky, right? So you can't really do that now with COVID. However, what we have done is 
Now we're doing them in Zoom. <laughs> so we have um, Zoom meetings that they're Zoom meetups now. <laughs> so we've now moved from the, the in-person to the Zoom meetups. So we didn't completely say you can't do it anymore because that's, you know, that's going to impact morale and it's going to impact team cohesion. So now folks are now we're helping people enabling them to do to take it on Zoom. Yeah, I love that. And it, it's certainly like a different type of connection, Other having a happy hour over it. Yeah, it's like a different, like, <laughs> it's like a different type of connection, having a happy hour over Zoom. We've had, um, I think uh, our team's had three happy hours over the past three weeks. Uh, and I really look forward to it now. <laughs> On a Wednesday, about five or six o'clock, everybody's kind of got their drinks together and everyone's having uh, a conversation. It's like a, a different sense of connection because people are in their homes and they're preparing their dinner and their partner's walking by and, you know, we're grabbing them and asking some, some questions. And um, Katie on my team has been like showing us how to make particular uh, drinks and like what she's been cooking and stuff. And um, yeah, I actually kind of find that um, kind of more connection driving than, than you could argue even a person. So uh, I love that um, Zoom is allowing us to do that and we're not, we're not stopping our happy hours. Um, I want to move on to uh, the next question, uh, which is for you, Hope. Um, how do you find the right balance uh, when it comes to communication or, or not over communicating? Uh, this comes from Catherine and she says, um, I don't want important things to become lost in the noise, um, but I also don't want to hold meetings that could have just been an email. Catherine, what a great question. Um, I really feel and we feel at Envision, you know, we talked about it in our earlier session was just really around being able to over communicate. Um, if you feel in everybody's organization is going to have a different threshold around the appropriate communication path. And, it, and as I mentioned before, and if, it, if you don't feel like it's working and it's getting lost in the noise, then um, think about your approach a little bit differently. Um, you know, for us, where we probably lose um, some level of, um, you know, getting lost in the noise where we get kind of stuck there for us is with email. Um, but for other organizations, that may be your main mode of um, communication. So I would suggest a couple of things is think about if you're using email, really think about what your subject looks like and in capital letters, urgent or need action or please read and then do an acknowledgement, something funny in the middle of the email that's like, oh, you know, did you know that I had leopard print shoes on today? Um, you know, please reply yes or no, you know, whatever it looks like, right? So that you'll know that that message is coming out, right? Another thing is really thinking about um, when you're doing the same thing with Slack. I do this actually quite a bit with my team. Um, as you start to have, and, and you can probably do the same exact thing in all of the other, um, all the other uh, GChat and, and those other things, is, um, you know, being able to tag everybody in a message in Slack, you can just do here for everybody that's in that message or in that channel. Um, and then one of the things that I do is I always say, hey, just reply back with your favorite um, emoji so that I know that you saw this. Um, that way I can kind of get an idea on if there is something that I urgently need to get out there, but I know I don't have time to jump on a meeting to do it. Um, and then the other thing that you could also try is um, is the video piece, especially if that's something that you're not, um, that's not a normal communication path for you. Um, most of the time teams were gonna be like, oh my gosh, they took the time to do this video. Um, I better look look at it really quick. But just, you know, keep your content, if, if you're able to keep that content time a little bit um, shorter than, than you may normally think about. That's great. Um, thank you, Hope. Uh, Ryan, uh, this question is from Jess. Uh, Redfern, she said, um, how do you keep a pulse check on the engagement, mental health and well-being within each of your team and your company? Uh, on mute again, Ryan, sorry. I do that like three times a day easily. So we have this initiative here called Healthy Smart Bug. And it comes from this idea that as a parent, you know, your job is to keep your children happy, healthy, safe, and resilient until they can do it for themselves. And so about a year ago or so, we wonder why we don't do that for our company since it's kind of the same idea. So healthy meaning, um, you know, uh, healthy financials, um, healthy dynamic with people, happy meaning engaged customers, engaged team, safe meaning safe decision making and being able to protect yourself in the market and resilient meaning that you know 
life happens and sometimes it doesn't happen your way and you need to learn how to, to get through that. So, um, the managers on the teams, as well as um, some of the senior leadership will um, pick a theme for a quarter and they'll call up and usually have a 10 or 15 minute discussion with a teammate that there's no preparation, but it's just um, how can we make uh, smart bug healthier. And so you get these, um, based on that, you get some really interesting uh, feedback from people and often the question that being able to ask why after that question is so much more powerful than like in a, an EMPS score or an office five score or something because you can often um, on the anonymous things you can often mistake problems when they're not and for example we had a, a person here who on the anonymous feedback piece they raised their hand with their name and they said that they had they were you know concerned about their stress it wasn't stress it was the fact that they felt like that they needed to be tied to their desk and so when you ask them how they what would happen or what happens if you don't, if the client calls and you're not there and they're like well in my other job i would just call them back i'm like so what's the difference so we put a plan together that said okay i want you to go to the gym at some point not lunch and not after the gym because the gym was important to that person take a selfie in front of the gym. I want you to do it three times today. And at the end of the week, let's have a discussion and we'll figure out whether the world fell apart. And it didn't. And you would not have had, um, you would not have been able to, to engage with them and unlock that kind of insight unless you have a face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, and thank you so much for sharing. That's, that's so interesting. I think uh, one of the big things that I'm realizing as we, as we go through this is giving the teams permission to not be locked to their desks and not be online from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. Um, and I think a lot of that, like a lot of changing that mindset starts with you as the leader or like the leaders within the business. And so this week, for example, um, hopefully the weather's gonna get better, but hopefully this week, I'm gonna take all of my one-to-ones as I'm walking around the park. Uh, because last week when I was doing my one-to-ones, a couple of people's videos didn't work and yeah, they just said, oh, can you just call me? It's gonna be easy. And I'm sat at my desk calling this, this person like I don't need to be in front of my computer. Uh, so um, I think that's one of the things that um, I've certainly underestimated over the past few weeks is actually how we just need to give the team permission uh, to do that and um, you know, productivity will remain. So thank you for sharing that, Ryan. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa, this question's um, from you, uh, for you. Uh, this is another question that came up uh, quite a lot uh, and it was, um, what software uh, do you use or recommend for remote working? For example, communication, conferencing uh, and team recognition? So for conferencing, we used a combination of a few things. We used Google Hangouts quite a bit for small conference. Like if you have about 10 people, Google Hangouts works well for us. Larger, we use Zoom. Um, for recognition, we use Reflective. Reflective mm -hmm. is a great tool that allows peer-to-peer -peer recognition and integrates with Slack. It is used very often. We have about an 85 percentage usage rate. So um, people are using it. And it's really cool because if someone did something really nice for you or helped you with a really big project, you can go right into Slack and do a quick kudos. We have a kudos channel and the entire company gets, um, gets pinged. Um, and then people start chiming in and really cool emojis. So it has a lot of um, engagement. So those are the tools that we use right now. I'm a strong believer that you pick three or four tools and you stick to those and you test them. Because when you offer too much, then it becomes too much noise. And then it becomes distracting. And it actually has the opposite effect of what you're trying to create. Absolutely. That's great advice. And I've seen that work well as well when you connect that back to your values, but so rec recognizing the team through your values as well, especially, especially remotely. Um, all right, we're going to move on to uh, hiring. Uh, the questions that came up around um, how best to hire remote and, and best practices around that. So the first question uh, is for you, Hope. Uh, this was asked um, a few times as well. Uh, and it was, how can I engage candidates during hiring freezes uh, and build interest so that they're ready when we are? What a great question. And um, some of the things that we're doing and some of the things that I've done um, in previous times where we may not have been um, looking for a specific type of a role, but I knew we would, um, is really thinking about, you know, something that 
is going to get your candidate excited to even have a conversation. And so thinking about your outreach, how creative you can be with your outreach, being creative, um, also, you know, really being able to provide in that first conversation, whether it's through a Slack channel, whether it's through LinkedIn, whether it's through an email, or if you know, you're using, um, using text or a phone is get them excited about wanting to talk to you. And then, you know, being very prepared when you have that conversation of talk, you know, really thinking about it, like what's in it for them. Um, we try to frame all of our conversations around what's in it for you and then take the time to educate if we need to educate um, in short snippets and then continually follow up. I think of recruiters as, um, as a sales team. <laughs> and so a lot of those same, um, a lot of the same principles that we would use like from a CRM and, you know, continuing follow up and, you know, getting to the top of an inbox or the top of, you know, wherever it is, I look at that as a way to stay engaged. Um, now, as I mentioned previously in, um, in our last session, you know, now's a really good time to get yourself out there and just have those conversations. People wanna to talk to you. And if you don't have something for them today, they're gonna to remember that conversation when you reach out to them later. They're like, oh gosh, that's the one person that called me. That's the one company that sent me a note. Just say, hey, how's, you know, hope things are going well. Um, and you know, those people may not be the right fit for your company, but they probably will be the right fit for another company. Um, who may have, who may or may not be your client or may or not, may or may not um, be a decision maker at some point. So um, I think really being sure that you're crisp, um, you're creative and you're impactful on those first outreaches um, is going to really keep people engaged. But then the follow up is also the other part that is um, very important. Yeah, it's, it's so important, isn't it, that the follow-up piece. I mean, the moment a candidate starts interviewing with your, your company, they're, they're perceiving your brand and your employer brand. Uh, you know, and especially within that technology hiring, for example, the competition for uh, top tech talent is so high. It, it's so important for you to reflect you know, your brand in the right way. And something so simple as keeping tabs or keeping a weekly check-in with somebody, and that goes a long way. Similarly, with providing feedback as well. If people right. find themselves with, I guess it's slightly more time now because hiring has slowed down, then double down on the feedback and actually invest in people who don't even work for your company uh, because they could, they could do it at one point and they'll go on to promote your brand after that experience anyway. Um, thank you, Hope. Yeah, There's the no one sense. other thing I would add just really quickly, and I'm sorry I didn't add this in earlier, Please. is if you are in fact interviewing somebody for a um, Evergreen or a sourcing rack, whatever it is that you want to call it at your company, make sure that that candidate knows that these are, you know, very much just a conversation because the last thing that you want to do is, you know, un, you know, by no, you know, ill will, you are thinking this candidate will think, oh gosh, I'm interviewing for a job that I could start in, you know, three weeks or a month or something like that. Um, but just saying, hey, just be very open and upfront that we're having conversations and, you know, when we, and we expect to hire this position at, X amount of time. Right. Yeah, that's, Sorry, that's, that's actually where I, that's actually where I was going is just to be upfront with them and let them know that it's not there yet, but that you care about them enough to invest the time. It means a lot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay, Melissa, we had a question here from Nancy uh, asking, how do you prepare candidates for remote interviews? Great question. Um, so I don't think I would prepare a candidate any different for a remote interview, except to say a few things. Make sure that um, you don't make the mistake that I made, that my name right there is Avery. <laughs> and that you're, if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're on Zoom, make sure that you tr um, go on there, prepare yourself in terms of your video, making sure your video is set up in the right way, that you're presenting yourself in, in, with like get dressed for the interview, right? Like if you were actually walking into an office, you wanna at least from the waist up, get dressed if you're going to be sitting because it also says something to you. Um, there's like this psychological effect when you get dressed and you are presenting yourself very professionally as opposed to sitting with pajamas and being super relaxed 
and that will come through in an interview. And it also depends on the type of company that you're working with for or you're interviewing for. If it's like an uptight, really um, financial services type company, you want to make sure that you're, you're, you're looking the part. But like for Stack Overflow, for instance, for us, we're super casual. We actually invite people if they have a cat or a dog they want to introduce in their interview. They can do that too because I think it starts to build rapport. So we tell our candidates that it is okay that if you have a pet or something, we're happy to meet them. Um, and so it just builds rapport, the person feels better. So those are some of the things that we do to sort of prepare our candidates for remote interviews. We, we do the opposite. Um, we don't prepare them at all because we feel like um, you know, there's enough out there about our culture and how we work and how we behave that we want to see what they're like and not coach them before we meet them. And a lot of the first impression stuff is so important that, you know, for example, to use that a point, if, if somebody doesn't have the, um, you know, the wherewithal to dress appropriately, it doesn't mean they have to wear a suit, but to dress appropriately and have their workspace picked up. I, I want to know that. I don't want to tell them to do that before their interview. I want to know that because they're going to represent our brand. So short of telling them who they're going to interview with, we don't give them any preparation at all because that's part of the interview. For us, for us we actually do because we, uh, we, we do have this um, dichotomy where we hire people who are actually have gone to an office for many years and now are going remote. So for us, we do, and it, there is a fundamental shift and difference when people um, are going into an office as opposed to working remote. So yeah. we, we have a tendency to, to actually prepare people. Oh, that's cool. Great, interesting. Two, two uh, interesting perspectives. Um, I'm going to move on, Ryan, uh, to a question for you uh, from Shelley, uh, asking, um, how does the hiring process for executive level employees differ? Um, I am worried that they won't accept an offer without meeting the CEO or other C-levels in person. Um, that, so for us, an executive role, you come, you come to California, which, I mean, there's worse places to go, but... Um, you, you go through the whole interview process, there's usually a couple, and then we do try to meet people face to face because at the end of the day, right, you want to spend a significant amount of time with that person. Um, and I think they appreciate the investment. And like I said in the other session, right, people are making this decision and it's a trade off. There's an opportunity cost of not taking something else. So you want to meet that person in person because it's also a chance for you to demonstrate for them that you have your act together. Um, and make a more personal connection with them. So in that particular case, like we recently hired a COO, everything was remote except for the last couple interviews and those were in person over a full day, basically. Hope, do you find the same? Final sign off in person? Yeah, final sign off in person um, in most cases. However, I will say over the course of the last um, few weeks, we've had to make a, <laughs> a, few, um, a few shifts. And what I will say, and, and one thing that I'm very proud of in our executive recruiting program is that we know that for some people, this is a little bit of a shift in terms of, you know, not meeting everybody right away. And so what we have is a very strong communication path back to the recruiter who is checking in at like every single conversation and having those meaningful conversations and tying it back to our culture. Then what we also have is we have our, um, our, we have our CEO and he will do multiple check-ins and deeper dive conversations as they're going through the interview process, just depending on the specific role. And for us, we always tie back and I'm just going to show you guys this because I think it's kind of important when there's a lot of questions around, you know, culture and how do you drive that? And one of the things that we have is we have all of our principles and you'll see here, there's these cards. And we show them a lot in our interviews. And so if I'm talking to an executive level candidate and we're on a certain focus, I'll say, oh, well, gosh, we're really talking about principle number two, co-ownership. And we start tying those things back together, right? So while they're feeling like, gosh, this could make me really feel comfortable working in that remote environment. And then when we get to that final conversation, that's the in-person um, conversation, it, it, it flows a lot better and it's not nearly as uncomfortable that's really interesting uh especially with the the ceo chipping in at different stages of the process 
rather than saving the CEO for the big scary sign off at the end um, because you've already built a relationship throughout the process. Um, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, hope actually staying with you for the next question. Uh, what software do you use or recommend for remote hiring? For example, ATS, ATS whiteboarding uh, or video interview software. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, great question. And I will say from an ATS perspective, I think there's a lot of different ATSs out there. Um, and, you know, you have to make sure that they make sense for what your goals are. If you're looking at a lot of virtual, you know, virtual high volume hiring, an ATS may look a little bit different than somebody who is doing more specialized hiring and the volume's not as high. Um, currently, right now, we're using Greenhouse at Envision. Um, and from a whiteboarding perspective, thanks. Um, we actually have at Envision a really great product called Freehand. And it's free for, and it's a virtual um, whiteboard. And you can communicate and you can, everybody can be on, um, everybody can be on at the same time. And so we use that. And, um, and we're starting to see a, a large uptick over the course of the last uh, month in terms of, um, uh, in terms of people downloading and things like that and starting to use that. So that's one thing that we use. And then from a video um, interview software, there's a couple things. And so we don't use this today, but there are um, really great companies out there. Montage is one where you can, in the application process, you can have somebody do a video as part of their application process and it can stand alone inside your, um, outside of your ATS or it can, in a lot of times now, most ATSs have that capability as well. We don't use that today for us, but what we do use on all of our um, interviews um, is Zoom. Thank you, Hope. Um, Ryan, Melissa, do you have anything to add there? Um, no, I mean, we're probably not as sophisticated based on our size as, as Envision is. Um, we use Zoom, we use like a lower level ATS. Um, we do, we do that video. We do you video for a lot of different positions where people submit a video first, like I mentioned in previous sessions. Mm -hmm. And that's a fantastic way to, to understand how dynamic and charismatic people are for certain roles. Oh, so you, you ask them to do a video recording as like an initial screening process. Yeah. We usually ask them to ask or answer two or three questions, no editing so that they don't feel like pressured and they'll use something like Vidyard or some other kind of browser based. Cool. Uh, plug in to submit it and we're, we're basically looking for like how do they carry themselves what does their workspace look like do, you know can you create can you can you see yourself having an hour-long conversation with this person are you intrigued by the way that you know the content of their responses and those types of things it ends up being a you know um, I'd say probably 80% of the time it's a weed out thing more so than it is um, a connection builder but that other 20% of the time you listen to a video from somebody and you really really want to talk to them and it allows you to kind of disposition the applications a little bit better. Yeah, so certainly for companies that are receiving a high volume uh, of candidates, replacing the initial phone screen with you know a brief to send in a video, I can imagine that being quite a uh, efficient way to uh, drive that the top of the funnel. There, it's really interesting. Um, Melissa, were you going to add something? I'm not sure if I could tell if you yeah, were mute. I mean, the, yeah, the only thing that I was going to add was that I use. Um, I don't know, hope if you used this before, but we use um, Zoom Whiteboard. Um, for our technical whiteboarding sessions, it works really well. But besides that, all the other tools that Ben talked about in the screen, but we're on Thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to the final section uh, around onboarding. Uh, I think we have about five questions here. Um, Melissa, the first question is for you. Um, you may need to just adjust your mic, just so, um, or maybe speak up just a little, a li little faint. Um, but ho hopefully we'll catch you. Um, so the first question is from uh, Lisa Murray, uh, who asked, how can you adapt a virtual onboarding approach when the company isn't necessarily tech savvy uh, or one that really embodies a learning culture? Oh, wow, that is a tough one. Can you hear me? Can you hear I think me? we're good. Okay, perfect. Um, so I think, wow, I got a really tough one here. So if somebody wants to jump in and help me. Um, I'm typically accustomed to working with cultures that are very tech savvy. So I think I will try my best to answer this the best way possible. So I think the first thing I would do is probably run an education um, sort of like class to help people get up to speed with some of the remote tools 
that we would be using. I think that's the very first step that you would have to do. If the company is not tech savvy, you wanna start foundationally teaching them how to use the tools. And I would probably start with a very basic Google Hangouts um, type of tools because it's the easiest to use. Um, and then on the learning side, um, with a company that's not learning focused, um, I think what I would say there is that I think that if you actually go out to certain people and you start really digging deep, you'll probably find that it is a learning culture. It just hasn't been cultivated. Like the, the, the learning piece hasn't been cultivated in the organization. And then that takes a little bit of planning um, to go out there and start creating a learning organization and people who actually have an appetite. When you find those two or three people, make them your champions, teach them and help them spread the word. That's typically how I operate in every single program in an organization. I look for my champions, the people who really care deeply about these things. I engage them and then they go out and then they share the, and spread the really great um, things that we're trying to initiate in the organization. That's how I would approach it. Thanks, Melissa. Um, Ryan Hope, do you want to chip in here? Um, <clears throat> any, any companies maybe a bit reluctant to, uh, I guess, like invest either investing in tech or, you know, maybe naive to think that going remote is something that they can um, kind of sweep under the rug? Sure. Um, so usually the non-tech savvy part is a confidence thing. So um, what we found is that um, if you mix kind of mentorship and small videos and exercises and give people small wins where they can create some momentum, then it's not as daunting. Um, I mentioned in the last section we do these things called get to know you calls, which are 20 minutes with the employees here and you, you do a 20 minute session with each employee and you can't talk about work. That's really important because it builds some friendships where people can go to if they have quick questions and they don't feel like that they're the one raising their hand every time. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you break it down into small things, give people some quick wins and give them um, kind of a support network to, to uh, lean on a little bit, then that's much easier. Great, thank you. Um, Hope, uh, this next question for you. Uh, 15 people uh, asked this question. Um, and it is, how do you complete I-9s and W-4s remotely? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. So, um, and it's one that, you know, comes up quite a bit. So there are companies that um, you can work with specifically around the I-9 um, and the W-4. So when I onboarded and the way that we onboard at Envision is within, you know, within the week before you start, you get all, and, and sometimes two weeks, you'll get all of the information that you need to fill out. And that data, you know, sits inside whatever HRIS that you have. But for those pieces that need to have a person, um, there are companies that you can work with where you just go and you, um, you go and you meet a notary in your town. Sometimes that notary, if they're, you know, if there's not a place to meet, they come to your house or you can meet at a Starbucks or a lot of times it's in an attorney's office or, or something like that where there's a notary already there. Um, and there's, and I can, um, I can put in um, some messaging what company we use to do that. Thank you. Um, more of a logistical question there. Um, okay, Melissa, another question for you. Um, and this was, this is a, a poignant question, um, given that, you know, given the challenges of uh, COVID-19 right now, lots of companies uh, are switching their full-time roles to uh, more contract roles. Um, so do you have any experience with hiring independent contractors? Uh, if so, does the onboarding look the same for them as it does W2 employees? I have a lot of experience onboarding international contractors. Um, at Stack Overflow, we actually have contract, international contractors in Russia, Israel, like Poland, all over the world. Um, a couple of things that I would highly recommend First and foremost, I would say if you are considering expanding internationally and you want to be compliant, you really should consider looking at a global PEO, which is a provider employer organization. 
there's so many reasons why you want to take that approach and not take on international contractors yourself because you're not you have to set up legal entity to pay these folks there's statutory benefits that are required by that country that i can assure you you will not probably be compliant so i would highly and strongly recommend you go the peo route if you're looking to hire 10 15 contractors so that's one piece of it. Um, I think the second question was around how do you onboard them, correct? Yeah. Yes, correct. So the onboarding piece for us is no different than what we would onboard someone in the United States or an employee. We start with that. Um, I have a, the three pillars that I talked about in my first, um, my first session that was first, the first 30 days was connection. The, the, the second, the 60th day was about learning, and then the 90th day was about goal setting. We go through the entire process the same on the international contractor side. That's but, great. It's interesting that uh, contractors go through that same processes, I guess, uh, full time, full time employees. That's great. Um, okay, couple, two more questions left actually before we kind of wrap up. Uh, this next question is for you, Ryan, uh, and it comes from Tony. Uh, asking, how can you replace the experience uh, of a new hire coincidentally meeting a coworker over lunch? Yeah, you can't. Um, but you can do other things, though. Um, you guys mentioned before that you had virtual happy hours. And I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can do. I think one of the things that um, we try to do is we try to build um, small intimate groups where people can spend some time with each other and those roll up into slightly larger groups and slightly larger ones. So um, anytime people get together for what we call an IRL and in real life, um, we pay for it. So now you have this network of people that when people travel around the country, they, there's always a smart bug somewhere that they can go hang out with and we take care of that, uh, whatever dinner and all those types of things. Um, once a year, we have a um, what's called Smart Bug of Palooza, and what we realized is that um, um, for our brand, we want to we bring people out to a five star resort somewhere on the West Coast, and the idea is that we take people to places that they otherwise wouldn't go to because we want to associate that experience with our brand. And it's really interesting to see people who've worked together for six months and you don't, you don't know whether you want to high five somebody or hug them or shake their hand or what, but 10 minutes later, the relationship that they had online is now just the same as it is in person. And so um, even though it seems awkward to not be able to grab a lunch with somebody, you're still building it's like, it's like you're building up this kind of like um, friendship capital for when you actually do get to meet in person and we make sure that that happens. It just seems a little bit awkward, but those relationships are just as strong. They just get unleashed when people see each other in person. Yeah, I love that. Um, Hope, you were, you were nodding along there. I'm not sure if you had anything you wanted to add there. Yeah, and it, it and it's so true what Ryan was saying is like when you have those opportunities to really get together and you, um, you get to see the really see that person for the first time you're like you may think gosh you know what you're much taller than i thought or much shorter than i thought but all of a sudden all of those things you i mean you you know literally can become some of the closest relationships that you've had in like your adult life by um and, and not meeting for multiple years so and then when you meet in person it's like this amazing moment <laughs> it's it's so true i i can really relate to that it's like um it's similar to like when you know, you know when you don't see your friends for a few years and you're kind of a bit apprehensive when you catch up with them after like two minutes it's like my goodness it's like we were hanging out just last week um when i was in london i was working with our team in san francisco um i had formed such close relationships with people i was working with after two minutes of being with them in person you know we i already knew everything about that person uh it was more just a continuation of our relationship so that, that really resonates um ryan let me know next time you're going to a five-star resort i'll send you my uh favorite identity after <laughs> love, love to come along and join you for that one. Um, okay, so uh, last question, uh, and we'll go through um, everyone. We'll start with uh, you, Hope, and then we'll go to Ryan and Melissa. Uh, and the question is, um, what software are you using or would you recommend uh, for remote onboarding? Yeah, and, and I think it really depends on the size of your company, what you want your onboarding to look like. 
I think first and foremost, the most important part is going to be whatever video conferencing that you're using. So for us, it's Zoom. Um, and then I would say get creative. Um, get creative in ways with different technologies um, where you can do collaboration together, right? So for us, freehand is a big part of, um, um, of what we do in our onboarding piece that helps us not only, you know, work with each other and get used to working in a remote environment where you're collaborating, but it also teaches everybody, regardless if you're in finance, sales, engineering, everything about one of our products. So for us, that's super important. And then lastly, um, you know, making sure you have a great sur survey tool so that you can gather that feedback and, um, you know, continue to evolve what your onboarding process looks like. That's good. What, which survey tool do you use, Hope? We use a variety of different ones, okay. um, but we do a lot of Google Forms right now um, for onboarding because we want the, the written data coming back sure. um, for that. But we use a lot of other survey tools, tools as well. That's great. Uh, and Ryan? Um, most of the same. Um, we use Bamboo HR for our um, HRIS system. Um, so that has a lot of the onboarding checklist. And then once you're done with the HR part of it, the like kind of job specific stuff is in teamwork, which is what we use for production. Um, we do 30, 60, 90 day onboarding surveys. We use Google for that stuff too. Um, and then the last step of the onboarding for us is we tell people that at the end of the day, use your judgment because you're clearly a smart person. You made it through our interviews and you're clearly qualified. So you're going to be right most of the time. Don't be afraid to make a decision based on your judgment. Um, and that's how we, that's kind of the last tool that we use, although it's not a technology tool. Sure. Thank you. And Melissa. It's a lot of the same exact tools. We um, heavily lean into Hangouts, Google Hangouts because it's like what we use um, within the office. Uh, for our surveys, we use Office Buzz. We actually have designed, um, so we designed the 90-day employee experience um, within those sections that I talked to you about, like connection, um, learning, and then uh, performance goals. And we have our um, survey focused on those three areas for the 90 day and then how are they embodying their core values and then mm -hmm. how are the core values showing up within the first 90 days we're just curious it's not what we tell people has nothing to do with whether that's not going to be a performance metric it's all about like where did you sort of encounter empowering people to deliver outstanding results give us an example those types of things. Um, it's so interesting when you look back at those survey results because you're like, wow, I never thought that that, I would never make that connection um, that this new hire made to that specific core value. So it's so interesting to, to watch, um, but pretty much the same tools that uh, both Hope and Brian talked about. That's great. Thank you. Okay, uh, last question. This wasn't uh, on our list to go through, but uh, I, I'm just curious. Um, for each of you, we, we've covered lots, lots, lots of advice from the webinar and this Q&A, uh, lots, lots of content. But um, my, I guess my question is, if you had a friend who was going to move their business remote tomorrow, and they're going to open their laptop at 9am tomorrow, just what is the one piece of advice that you would give them? Uh, and hope let's start with you. Give yourself a little bit of grace. You're not going to be perfect at everything. You're going to have some things that, you know, go amazingly well. And then you're going to have some areas where you can learn from and just make sure and, you know, give yourself grace and don't take yourself too seriously. Ryan. Trust people and don't overanalyze things. And Melissa. Trust. Um, I would say trust that every interaction um, and a, that comes with good intent and that everybody wants you to succeed um, and that everybody wants um, the company to succeed and you know that that sort of intention piece where if you make a mistake it's really not a big deal what hope talked about don't take yourself too seriously because at the end of the day we're all in it together absolutely um that's great thank you so much i would just echo that this like uh, back to how i kind of opened up the webinar the other day um this is a really challenging time but it's also 
a, a, a very important one for us to adjust. Uh, we're all in it together and we will figure this out um, together. Um, so Hope, Ryan, Melissa, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, in the webinar and this Q&A. Uh, and uh, I know that we'll be sending uh, this recording out with the original webinar. So thank you all uh, and best of luck with everything over the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you for having us.